for me a shot that is clear mm, whisper some sweets in my ear and turn out the lights turn out the lights turn out the lights we're gonna have one of those jing somnia nights yeah and good evening good evening good evening welcome once again to another episode of Jinsomnia Nights. Joining me, my fellow host, uh, Miss Lee Ramirez. Hello. And our guest for tonight is a uh, fellow filmmaker and mentor, Miss Ida Del Mundo. Hi. Hello, good evening. Good evening, good morning. Or good or good, good morning, morning, depending on where you <laughs> yes. are. Actually, where are, where are you right now, Miss? Um, I'm it's, in... Looks like it's day at time. Yes, it is uh, 10 a.m. <laughs> um, I'm in New York right now. So I've been kind of stuck oh, here because of the pandemic. Um, but yeah, good morning. Thanks for having me. Oh, so you've been stuck in New York since the lockdown? Yes. <laughs> How is that like? I mean, th- does Frank Sinatra sing while you walk <laughs> along the streets? <laughs> well, because <laughs> that—that's how I always imagined it. It's—it's it's actually interesting that you say that because um, that whole like maybe one two months that everyone would clap for um, the frontliners. I don't know if you saw that like online or on TV or whatever. Yeah, the yeah. every seven a.m. at uh, seven mm-hmm. a.m. seven p.m. Um, we would um, clap for the frontliners, and then um, they would like play New York, New York, <laughs> or they would blast um, uh, Empire State of Mind on the speakers. So it's kind of what you're expecting. Mm. <laughs> it's really Billy funny. Joel. Uh-huh. That's so cool. So, yeah, another of my favorite singers. <laughs> but uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. I mean, oh, uh, your work or what do you do? Okay. Um, I'm Ida Del Mundo. I am a writer, filmmaker, um, and I also teach. So, um, and I'm also a musician. Um, mm-hmm. I write for the Philippine Star. Um, right now, I don't because the, I, I write for the um, tourism section and um, the Sunday magazine, which are both on hold right now because of the pandemic. Um, and um, my first film came out in 2004 in Cinemalaya. It's called Kana the Dreamweaver. It's about the Tiboli indigenous people of South Cotabato in Mindanao. Um, and that was mm. my first um, ever film in general. Um, I, I didn't have um, film background or whatever. Um, so... Yeah. Um, and since then, I've been doing music videos. I've been sh- um, shooting short form um, videos with my friends. And yeah, and then I'm, I'm also a musician. I play the violin. I used to be part of the Manila Symphony Orchestra. Really? Mm-hmm. <laughs> wow. Wow. You play the violin. Yeah. You know, I've always dreamed about playing the violin as a Wow. Child. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm a musician as well, actually. Mm. But I never got into playing violin. You know? <laughs> After hearing, you know, Liszt or Bach. Yes. I love that I, you say it no, correctly. I, I can't do this. Bach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm a classical music aficionado, awesome. actually. Awesome. Since childhood. Okay, yeah. But uh, what, uh, what have you been doing? I guess you could say. You've been around the block <laughs> since you've done a little bit of everything. I myself know a little thing or two about, you know, being around the block. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of but, everything. Uh, but perchance, uh, what do you do right now? You know, as a, you said, you write for the newspaper, Philippine Star? Yes. Um, so right now, as I said, um, I haven't been writing for Star um, during this time. But um, I recently started teaching online again um so uh college of saint benil and dlsu started their term um this this month so 
we've been on our first and second weeks of class already. So that's what's keeping me super busy. Um, everything's online, uh, which worked out for me. Mm. So I still have a job while I'm stuck here. Um, and it's been pretty challenging to transfer everything online. Um, and yeah, so so I've been teaching. I didn't expect to still be here in New York at this time. So all of my classes ended up being like, 1 or 2 a.m. here or like 11 p.m. So it's pretty crazy. But yeah, that's what's been keeping me busy. And I've been trying to also work on a couple of scripts, maybe like a short film while I'm here too. Mm -hmm. Anything you would like to share? <laughs> About the scripts or the, <laughs> the film? Yeah. Um. Well, I guess because of everything that's happening, um, my... I'm working on like two script script ideas na um all of both of them are like about loneliness um mm -hmm. and kind of something like that and <laughs> and the short film I'm doing is a little bit about um my experience here in New York so also about like loneliness <laughs> that mm -hmm. is Loneliness in general or like yeah. loneliness uh -huh. in a pandemic? Good question, Certain. Lee, because she knows my story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. I, I'm sorry. No, then, I don't want to get too personal. Then, I'm just then saying. Then you have me at a disadvantage. <laughs> I don't know your story. Okay. Would you care so, to, you know, update me? Thanks a lot. Regard? You don't have to share everything no, if you don't I, want yeah, to. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, 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 understandably, I'm not a, you know, fellow sister. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's all right. Um, it's been, what? Um, more than a couple of months already since all of this happened. So yeah, mm -hmm. I think I can talk about it now. Um, so mm -hmm. as Lee knows, um, the reason why I, I'm in the, the States is because I kind of had to get away um, and take a break for a bit because um, I was supposed to get married um, last Feb and my ex fiance um, broke mm. up with me on December 26. <laughs> wow. Oh, holy fuck. Day after Christmas. Right? Very, very. I'm fun. very sorry to hear that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm very sorry to hear yeah, that. Yeah, so wow. I'm at that point. <laughs> you need a drink. I, so, yeah, I think. And, and thank you. And thank you for sharing this that. This is the perfect kind of scenario for this story with with alcohol <laughs> um so yeah um so the wedding obviously didn't happen and i didn't want to be in the philippines on the day of the um uh, of when the wedding was supposed to be so um yeah i i figured go as far as i can and um i spent a few uh, weeks in LA and then I came here to to New York and um, I got to go around for like maybe two or three weeks um, but after that uh, the pandemic happened <laughs> so um, mm -hmm. I kind of um, I, well it's 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 been pretty good because uh, I guess like I was forced to take more time to like heal cheesy <laughs> but, uh, mm -hmm. yeah I think th this kind of worked out for me a little bit more than expected mm -hmm. yeah so would you say that the coming of the pandemic and the lockdown is you know apropos in terms of gives you time to meditate yeah yeah um, for sure like I don't want to say that it's a good thing because it's a really bad thing for a lot of people. Um, well, so, you know, yeah. I'd like to think that we're already at that point. Uh, we could, you know, at least start to see the good things about it. Yeah, that's it, fair. Since it's obviously not going away mm, anytime that's soon. That's true. Um, mm. Yeah, so at least for me and my experience, it, it has helped a lot. And... Yeah, so uh, there was a time when like That's I couldn't good. talk about it, but now I'm good. <laughs> good. <laughs> That's my. Thanks story. for sharing that. Mm, thank I'm you. I'm sorry thank if you. it's like 
personal. I thought mm. we were going to talk about Would film. it be all right? <laughs> well, we're leading <laughs> up to that. <laughs> no, no. Because how yeah. can so you... How you can, said you're... Yeah. Because how can you make films if you don't know a thing or two about pain and loneliness? That's true. Yeah. True. Or art in general. <laughs> art true. in general. So, yeah. Um, so, that's why the films I'm doing now, um, they do have like... It, it has been partly influenced by the pandemic. Because it's kind of something that um, collectively people understand as like um, a time of loneliness, isolation. Mm -hmm. So that's how it becomes relatable. And then on the other hand, it's also like a personal um, take of of my own like journey through loneliness, mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. Would you mind my asking what? Can you say about loneliness or, you know, your journey through loneliness, as you said? Because I myself, all the things I know about loneliness only come from, you know, air supply songs. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, well, I guess one of the major things that I've kind of realized right now is um, definitely there's a lot of personal loneliness and it's a struggle but because of the pandemic um i realized that there are things much bigger than me that are going on and if you mm -hmm. look at it in the context of the world or in the context of you know the universe and and um mm -hmm. every everyone going through difficult things as well then your own personal like loneliness isn't as um isn't as heavy I think anymore, so that's how I've kind of they are somehow dealt with it. Belittled. Need one belittled. Need one belittled. But it's like, um, it 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 is like an important thing, but and like you can't belittle it. But it's not really mm -hmm. the be all and end all of of the world. So you you, you do feel like um, there are things bigger than what you're feeling right now. Does that make sense? <laughs> so how do you translate that? How do you translate that to art in the form of film in your case? Um, so I, I've been working on two scripts. One is um, something I've been working on actually even before this, this happened. And it's about this um, guy who is searching for his father um, in Japan. So I was telling Lee and the others uh, earlier in a, um, because of all the restrictions right now on shooting in the Philippines, um, my friends and I, mm -hmm. who are part of um, the the crew um, that that's going to shoot the film, we've been thinking of alternatives like um, let's try to shoot in like Japan or let's try to shoot somewhere else, but you know, it might be better. It might have less restrictions, and stuff like that. So this one is set in, in Japan and he's looking for his father who uh, um, who left him as a child. Um, so it's dealing with that type of loneliness. And then he meets um, uh, mm -hmm. Hikikomori. Um, it's these Japanese young adults who choose to isolate themselves from the world. Um, I think it's like a Japanese phenomenon. Um, I don't know if you've heard of that before. It's a current trend. It's, it's like a trend. I haven't, I haven't. Yeah, it's like a trend. Um, not super new, but uh, these young people um, kind of choose to isolate themselves. And he meets one of them. And they're, again, as I said, there, a lot of people are going through different kinds of loneliness. And he is actively mm -hmm. seeking out his father so that he isn't, as alone as he is in his life, while um, the Hikikomori that he meets, she has a family, but she chooses to separate herself from them. And that like idea of those two um, ways that they deal with loneliness um, it is kind of the center of the film. And then the other story I'm working on is more of um, more of a not really autobiographical, but um, uh, it, it centers around a, a girl who also um, went through like a bad breakup and she's dealing with it by um, traveling. So it, again, it's like 
um, set in different places and um, she meets these different characters who um, are part of the stages of grief. So this is like her grieving process. Um, and then, spoiler, we find out that these are all like in her head. Because I noticed like when I went mm-hmm. through this th- whole thing, I, I talked to myself a lot. I don't know if that's a good thing. <laughs> I do that right? as well. Okay. I, I feel that's like we all, do that. we all do that. I think everyone does that. Yeah. So like I'm not alone. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but yeah, so I noticed that I talked to myself a lot to kind of process everything. So um, the different characters that she meets like along the way of her her trip um that help her in these different stages um turn out to be like um the personification of people that she sees in her head or that people or characters that she mm. talks to in her head stuff like that i'm still working on it that's, that's just that's, it's very that's, that's as it's much very as i have right now <laughs> yeah well, if that was a pitch, that was a nice pitch. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Pasando. If I was a, you know, I was I was a TV network, you know, give you. Thanks. Five million pesos. <laughs> I wish you had five million pesos to give me. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I don't. <laughs> anyway, so. Times are hard uh, these days. How do you, how do you juggle all those things? You know, being a writer and being a director as well being a DOP be- and being a mentor a teacher as well from what i understand uh you and uh, you used to mentor Lee? yeah yeah she was one of my uh, most memorable mentees <laughs> really? oh, thank you how so how so um, I would like, to like hear that she was story. the one who would consistently come to our um mentoring sessions every week like the others they would come and then like other weeks they wouldn't but she would come every week really i was like the I think only one the only one but um like <laughs> it was like exactly. therapy <laughs> like she would say like you know this is kind of like yeah, therapy yeah, yeah. <laughs> and i'm like oh my god so much pressure um but yeah we would end up talking <laughs> about different things about life um and not just about um the thesis <laughs> And then everything that she wow. went through um, doing the thesis was pretty memorable as well. Yeah. And then <laughs> on the day of the defense, she got really great comments. So super proud. <laughs> yeah. Cool. You know, actually, I've, I've seen your film, Lee, actually, from Enzo and Andrea. It's very good. <laughs> I mean, parang the <laughs> No, I mean parang I, very I, I, good. I got, I got, I got the meaning. I got the meaning. You know, in terms of taking drugs and it's the, uh, you, know, you know, it's the pink, it's the pink elephant in the room. We have to talk about it because, you know, it's somewhat part of the art process. Or am I alone in that? Um, as as a professor, yeah. I don't think I can answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry for bringing it up, but I just, you know, I'm connected with it on a personal level as well. Mm. So, thanks. It's a good, it's a good film. It's a good yeah, film. Cool, it's very Lynchian cool. actually. You. It's very Lynchian. Thank. That's what I got from yes. the panel. Yeah, it's very that. like edgy. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were actually saying like, why don't you make it even more like experimental or whatever? So. I don't know how to do that. But <laughs> I'll keep that in mind. Man, I wish you were my mentor, Miss. <laughs> I really love mentoring. Um, like even more than teaching. Mm-hmm. I think I only teach just so I can be part of the like mentors. Are, there, are those two things separate? Um, would you say? Well, just in the terms of um the the school structure system, um. Like you can you can only mentor if you're actually teaching classes in a certain term, I guess. Mm. But uh, mentoring is much more personal. Um, you really work on something, cause like I was a literature major in in college. Um, really? Yeah, and and I have a, a a master's in creative writing. So I'm really well. I guess not when I got on to masters, but um, when I was in li- uh, in literature, um, I was all about like literary criticism and theory and stuff like that. But when I got into filmmaking, um, I kind of 
switched and and right now theory doesn't really make sense to me anymore um if it's only theoretical then i don't see the point but um if it's actually working on something um that produces um like you know a film that people can actually watch and people can be moved by um that's what i think is more important now rather than um criticism literary criticism <laughs> sorry to the literature mm-hmm, department mm-hmm. but um i think it makes more sense to me it's more um i guess practical but then also i think it has more impact so that's why i like mentoring because we're working on a project that that could have impact in many ways mm-hmm. is um, it since mentoring sorry 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 jack <laughs> Uh, I got no, a question. No, no, no. Like, yeah, no. uh, since you said mentoring is personal, uh, which is better than teaching, is is that what you're saying? Um, how is like online classes though? Oh. Is that the same mm-hmm. as teaching in person? Oh my gosh, that's a good question. Um, I, I'm on my actually second, first or second week of online teaching and. Honestly, for me, it's it's um, like a struggle um, because, as you said, you know, I, I like to be like I like to have more of a connection with the students and um, like with online teaching, not everyone like people aren't required to turn their videos on uh, or their cameras on. And even that kind of throws me off a little bit. Um, because I like being in a classroom, talking directly to people, and like seeing their reactions as well, and feeding off of that. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, I, I like mm-hmm. it to be more that that way. Whereas when you teach online, it's harder to make that connection. You still try to to go for that for sure, um, but I'm sure like mm-hmm. even you guys, even if you don't teach online or whatever, like. All of the online events that you've gone to during the pandemic, Actually, yeah. it's different. Yeah. I've never been in one. I've never been. In one. <laughs> so I attended like this yeah. online Zoom party, and you know it's it's something that you do because you're on lockdown. But then it's not exactly the same mm-hmm. thing. Um, and also like um, watching plays online, you do it because it's available. But then. I would still go out and watch like a play or like a Broadway play live, um, and it's a mm-hmm. different experience really? um, altogether. Yeah. You know, imagine just what Shakespeare would say if we watch Hamlet <laughs> online. It's just not the same. It's just not. The it's same. not the same. It, it's well. It's. It's a different experience. Like um, I watched Hamilton. Um, on Disney Plus, right? Um, and I've seen it live in London, um, and it's two completely different things. Um, it, You're very well traveled. I right? get to no. travel because of work, <laughs> so um, I get assigned to go places for Philippine Star, and then when I had my first film, um, I traveled for film festivals. So <laughs> I'm super lucky <laughs> to be in that um, kind of. To, to get those opportunities to travel. So, uh, something that I love to do then. Dream job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. So, yeah, and, um, yeah so it's really different. Um, and then also, there are so many, like, virtual exhibits that you can go to, which is great because of the accessibility. But then, on the other hand, it's different to be confronted with a work of art um, in person. Which is why I think mm. for film... It's a little bit better. It's it's a little bit easier to move online because um, how so? We're still watching the same film um, that you would watch like anywhere, um, except that mm-hmm. I I would say the the movie um, theater experience is obviously very different. Um, once I was right? say, seeing it on like a big screen um, is 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 a lot different than um, watching something on your laptop. You know, there's 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 something very personal about watching a film in the silver yeah. screen 
you know, it's sort of like a a, a tradition, yes, you know, yes. buying tickets, buying popcorn. Yeah. It's a yeah, ritual, it's a actually, ritual. in itself. I love that, yeah. And also, and then, like, even if you don't know the people that you're watching with, but you're watching it as a big mm-hmm. group in a theater, it's a different, like, communal experience with people that you don't know, but you're all watching the same thing. You're all experiencing the same film together. So that's what's lost mm-hmm. in um, watching a film online. Um, although the content, the, the actual film itself is something that, that's the same. You know, actually, I'm actually thankful in a way. And forgive me, I, I don't mean to step on any toes, but I'm just thankful in the sense that the pandemic, the quarantine, gives people the chance to realize what they have been missing on. Because prior to the pandemic, prior to the quarantine, you know, people went out to bars and parks and malls and coffee shops, not with friends, not with other people, but with these miniature miniature mirrors of infinite vanity. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Infinitely scrolling down, you know, what's up with the uh, interwebs or whatever you kids call it these days. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but um, um, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm somewhat of a Luddite. I'm not really a fan of, you know, technology. <laughs> yeah. At least in the sense, sense. At, at least in the sense that it takes away something very, takes away a part of our humanity. Mm, mm. It, it it becomes like a little barrier between, um, actually experiencing something, and being present in in a moment. Um, I I mm. experience that a lot since you know I travel for work and everything. So everything that I do, I have to document, um, like taking pictures or videos and sometimes it it kind of separates you from just experiencing something um so i have to remind myself from time to time just to experience something um and not like have to always think of documenting it or like getting a photo for yeah. instagram or something <laughs> I, I feel the same way because like, as much as I want to, like, document whatever I'm seeing, like, oh, there's a like, great landscape, I want to document this, put it on Instagram. But then I also have to think, like, okay, what filter am I going to use? Or, like, if I'm using a DSLR, all those mm-hmm. settings. So it kind of takes away the experience of, like, just look at it with your eyes and not through mm-hmm. the screen, yes, you know? Mm-hmm. for sure, for sure, yeah. And, you know, now everyone's so obsessed with high definition, you know, 4K, 6K, or 10, yeah. 10K, whatever. <laughs> I'm not really updated anymore. Yeah, I still use 1080p, <laughs> in fact. <laughs> but, yeah, everyone's obsessed with getting the, you know, crisper quality, the most higher crystal clear definition. But, you know, life is not in high definition. Life is not in crystal clear quality or, you know... Yes. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <Deep bro. laughs> Moment of silence. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Just take that all in. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. Like, there's this thing I've been seeing a lot. Um, people saying that you have to be the main character in your life, uh, which is like, um, we aren't we already the main characters of our lives? Well, you know, sometimes I'm three people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's Jack, there's Jacob, and then there's Mallory. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my first name is Mallory. Okay, by the way. <laughs> thanks for the the clarification. I was like, yeah. who's Mallory? <laughs> Yeah, I think that that like kind of yeah. goes back to the the script I was talking about, um, wherein mm-hmm. you either talk to a lot of inner voices or you are several different people at any given point in your life. How do you talk to yourself? Though I'm actually interested as a fellow, you know, crazy person <laughs> <Thanks> <laughs> who talks <a> to himself. <laughs> 
<laughs> like, do you actually soliloquize or like do you sp- actually speak or talk? talk? You know, I, I sometimes refer to myself in the third person. Like, um, I don't talk to myself aloud. I don't think. I actually just watched um, Blue Jasmine um, by Woody Allen yesterday and she, uh, the, the main character would talk to herself. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, yeah, I, I don't talk to myself aloud, but I talk to myself in my head. Um, and it's either me, mm-hmm. um, I kind, I'm kind of self-aware that um, I'm like using it to hash out my thoughts. So I have like a voice that's um, the pro side of an argument and I have one that's like, this is what you really want to do though. Um, so <laughs> and then that's how that all plays out. Um, so yeah, I, and also um, interesting question because I only thought about this right now. Um, I also mm-hmm. kind of have conversations with people that I know in my head. Like, this is what I really want to tell, like, my ex, for example. Likewise. Right? And and that's, Likewise. that turns out to be, like, a way to um, kind of figure out your thoughts as well. So I'm like, this is what I really want to tell you. <laughs> yeah, likewise, likewise. You know, in terms of faith and religion i don't really believe in gods or demons but i if there's one thing i believe in i believe in angels because i see one every day i talk to one every day (laughs) interesting i suppose that's how i'm gonna you know describe the act of talking to oneself (laughs) okay so this is you justifying what you're doing (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so this is how, you know, Miss Ida is as a therapist. Yeah, what was I like? <laughs> this is actually a therapy session, not a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, in that case, I wish I had you guys as a ther- as therapist back then. Because, <laughs> you know, back then, my therapist was a... I had this therapist who was a Spanish emperor, and there was the Archangel Michael, of course. I'm like, what's going on? You know, Emperor and oh, San Miguel. Okay, okay. <laughs> Got it. But yeah, actually, like I think the reason why um our mentoring sessions, like between me and Lee. Um, became sort of like therapy it's because when you do art when you do a film it it takes so much of you and it's such a personal process um making art making a film that like definitely um it's therapeutic in a way um yeah it's like a catharsis Mm -hmm. as you do your film so it, it it was only natural that um despite just mentoring someone doing a thesis film, um, like the the conversation would turn into something more like therapy, because the process itself of making a film is, is kind of therapy too. So how do you balance that though? Actually, I'm actually curious to know, as a fellow artist, like how do you balance that mentally? The fact that you're growing, go going through these personal things, and then there's your professional life, and then there's your everyday life, and then there's your artist life. Hmm. Well, I think. Like, how do you balance that? I think I'm lucky in a way that my professional life and art life and personal life does not have to be separate things. Um. Like, I don't know, some people are, like, in business and then their artist life is kind of vastly different from that, right? Um, so they, they work in different mm-hmm. worlds. But um, for me, I think everything that I do as a profession, whether it's teaching, writing, um, playing music, are all somehow related to um, to art and 
I don't have to separate myself from that. And then I think that also as an artist, you you really can't separate your personal life from from the work that you do. It's always um, influenced by by your experiences. So mm-hmm. um, yeah, I, I think that's also a difficulty of, of artists that you take your work so personally because this is who you are. This this is a part of your life, um, and mm-hmm. you know some people find it difficult to handle that. Um, so artists really have to be um, pretty strong. Like I won't even say stable, but but strong, um, like <sighs> mentally and um, like spiritually as well, uh, to be able to do your work. So, yeah. thank you, thank you, Rosalia. <laughs> I, yeah. I I really needed to hear that today. <laughs> That's great. <sighs> mm-hmm. I have a question. Uh, so your father, um, he wrote Manila sa kuko ng liwanag. Yeah, Manila sa kuko ng liwanag. Did I say yes. that correct? <laughs> yeah. So did, oh, your, like, fa- your father is your father is Lina Brock. No, um, he wrote. The- no, no. <laughs> I wish. I'm just kidding. Um, my, my dad is Doy Del Mundo, um, who wrote the script for mm. Manila. Yeah. So, what what was the question? Wow. So, like, like growing up, like, were you heavily influenced by his style okay. or his ways of working? Okay. Yeah. So, my dad, um, as I said, is Doy del Mundo, and he is one of the foremost professors of um, film in the Philippines, and he. Um, He wrote his first script was Manila sa Koko ng Liwanag, which he wrote when he was like 21, which is super annoying. Mm. <laughs> And wow. he wrote so that young. for his um, college class requirement. And um, really? he also um, wrote many of Mike De Leon's scripts. So batch 81 if you're familiar with that um nice. mm-hmm. kaka ba uh-huh. uh Bayaning Third mm. World um and and a lot more um and he is also the first winner of Cinemalaya so the first Cinemalaya um he directed Pepot Artista so wow. he won for that and that was actually his first time directing a a, a film when he was like 60 already or something. Wow, so. the first winner of Cinemalaya. When this was this? It was in 2000... it 2000... No, it was in 2004, <laughs> I believe. <laughs> oh, wait. Yeah, no. Um, mm-hmm. Something like that. Yeah. Um, well, so he... That, that must be a tough act to is, follow. It is, and that's why I never really... Um, to, to answer Lee's question, I never really thought of going into film. Uh, that's why I took literature. Mm-hmm. That's why I took creative writing, um, because I was thinking that's more of my thing. Um, I'm not gonna go into film because my dad's already like completely in the film world, um, so I, I wasn't doing it like um, super rejecting the idea, but it never really crossed my mind to to do a film myself. Um, I think the re- one of the major reasons why I was able to do a full-length film without any film background is because of my dad, um, because of the exposure that I got as a kid. Like, as a kid, I would watch um, mm-hmm. Kurosawa or, like, Bergman without mm. knowing that these are, like, classic films, right? Um, so my dad would just have them playing um, at home, and I, I would watch them, and I guess um, I somehow was influenced by that. And, like, I would visit him on set sometimes, Um, and the circles that I grew up in or the the people that I would call like Tito or Tita apparently are people in the film industry. <laughs> so um, that gave me sort of um, an advantage when, when I set out to do my own film. Um, just having that exposure to film as, as a young um, as, as a young child. But um, again, going back to the question, I I think that my style and my dad's style are super different. Like even he says it. 
Um, mm-hmm. Even the directing style is different. Like, um, he mm-hmm. likes to take his time a lot on set. He's very chill. And I am chill in a different way. Um, but I like things to go like a little bit faster. <laughs> um, and mm. yeah, uh-huh. so he was telling me like it's, it's very different seeing me direct. Um, and yeah, that whole experience. And, and even the, the works that we do are, are quite different from each other. Um, it's something that I try to do a little bit on purpose. Um, just because, you know, you want to separate yourself from, mm-hmm. from him. But then also I don't reject mm-hmm. the idea that I'm, I'm his daughter um, because it's something that, you know, it's something that I'm proud of. Um, actually, he is also like my, my grandfather um, is well known in the literary field. So he um, was a well-known writer really? as well. Um, is your grandfather Nick Wakil, no. perchance? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. My grandfather was Clodoaldo Del Mundo Sr. My dad is Clodoaldo Del Mundo Jr. So mm-hmm. he's been, my, my dad has all his life also been kind of under the shadow of his father as well. Um, mm. But uh, my, my grandfather wrote um, the classic Principe Amante, for example. And it's, it, it was a comic book. Uh, comic series um, and it was a radio show and then he was also the editor of this magazine called Liwayway which is one of the old um, literary magazines. I've heard of that actually. I've heard of that also. I've heard yeah, of that. Yeah, so he was a long time editor of that. Um, so it, we've been in like this kind of family who is into the arts mm. which which is lucky because you come from a long lineage of artists. Yeah, I, you're very lucky. Yeah, actually. I know. <laughs> it, it's really lucky because a lot of um, a lot of people who are into like film and the arts, like a lot of my students too, uh, they find it hard to kind of justify to their parents that like I want to be an artist, mm-hmm. I want to be a filmmaker. Actually, yeah. yeah actually, actually. <laughs> but yeah, I come from I come from said right, family. Right. <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm the only artist in the family. I'm the only dumb part. <laughs> so, so I I was able to kind of skip that part where um, your family questions your future if you want to go into arts. Mm-hmm. Was it ever like intimidating for you because your father and your grandfather were like really well known and they've had all these achievements or like did it ever pressure you? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A little bit, but I, I try to use the pressure in like a good way, um, like more of a motivation, like um, the, the idea that I have these kind of ancestors backing me up. Like my dad, he, w- whenever I write something that seems inspired, he always says, oh, um, sinapian ka ni tatay. Um, my, my my lolo. So he believes that like whenever we do something that is um that is like something inspired, something like really creative and stuff like that, he's like, okay, this is your grandfather coming to help you. <laughs> and I'm sure you've experienced something like that too. Like um, you get ideas that come out of nowhere but are like super amazing. Um, and mm-hmm. it, it's divine inspiration or. Um, yeah, so I, I take it that way instead of feeling pressure um, of having to live up to to a family name. But hindi ako magkalat. Okay lang. That would be a problem. <laughs> but, um, you know, yeah. basta you do your work well. And I, I get to ask my dad for a lot of advice, which is great. Um, then, yeah, he, he it, it's less pressure and more motivation. But would you say that that's what, you know, instigated the will to traverse the world of arts? You know, as you said, uh, you've done music, you've done writing, you've done film. That's actually a really diverse rap sheet, <laughs> <laughs> if you will. Um. Well, the the reason why I got into film is because I found a story that was so compelling that I wanted to tell it through film. So 
Um, and this tell th- this little story also kind of tells you how um, the different jobs that I have have become related. Um, so I was assigned mm-hmm. to cover the Tinalak Festival in South Cotabato. So Tinalak is the um, woven textile of the Dreamweavers of um, the Tibolis. Mm. So they have a festival every sure July, that. I think. So I was there as a journalist to cover the the event. And um, while we were there, part of the tour was to hike down a mountain to a cave um, at the bottom of this mountain. And we were told that it would be super easy. It's very near. Um, we didn't have that. We, we didn't have to wear like even proper shoes. Like literally, we were wearing flip flops. And um, they were like, "No, it's gonna take half a day, and then you're gonna go back up and have lunch in the city proper, and it's gonna be fine." And of course, it was not fine. <laughs> and um, so when we were starting the the trek down the mountain, it started raining really hard. Um, it was super muddy. Eventually, we started walking barefoot because we were slipping in the mud because of our um, sandals or our, mm-hmm. our slippers. Um, there were parts in the hike that we had to literally be repelled from one spot to another by this one guy who was like rigged to a rope or something and then it was super wild like i literally thought i was gonna die um and then when we (laughs) got to the cave at the bottom of the mountain um it was already like 5 p.m and it was getting dark and they told us like um we weren't expecting it to take this long and we only have like four flashlights and headlamps um, that we can use for um, for everyone. And this was like a group of 20 people. Um, so they were like, the, the best thing that we can do or the safest thing we can do is hike still, but just to the middle of the mountain where there's a, mm-hmm. um, where, where there's a small Tiboli village. So... Um, the village actually, uh, well, I mean, most people, uh, who, most of the Tibolis are already very modern. Um, like we're all friends on Facebook. Um, they, <laughs> they have, they have, they, Facebook, they have accounts. Facebook accounts. Like they're, they're super modern already. Like we wear the same things. Um, a lot of them are working abroad or, or in Manila. Kind of sad. That's kind of sad. It, it's a little sad, but then also it means that they are, um, kind of going with the times, but at the same time, they, they yeah, keeping, keeping up, up with, with the, the times, times. yeah. Um, but at the same time, they're also still like rooted in their culture, which is good. So they're also taught like all of their dances and weaving and and music and stuff like that. So, but um, this village in the middle of the mountain was one of the few um, s- remote villages still um, of the Tibolis. So it's a small community, no running water, no bathroom. No electricity, no food because they weren't expecting us to be there, and it was still raining. And they they let us stay in this little hut without any walls. And um, they, um, so they actually um started while while we were there. One of the elders started playing the hegelong, which is a two string kind of um instrument. And it wasn't like any of the cultural shows, right? It wasn't a tourist thing. She just sat down and started playing. And we we forgot that we were um, miserable. <laughs> we forgot that we were, were cold and, and wet and we were hungry. Um, and then the others um, in, in the community started singing and dancing. And it was such an amazing experience. So after I survived that... I felt like there was more that I had to do to talk about the Tiboli culture um, aside from writing a couple of articles about it. And I realized the best way to translate their culture is through film because film has the visual aspect, film has sound, so I can put in the music, um, film has motion, so you can have dance. Um, and then I used the mm-hmm. um, Tiboli language as well. So so the film is actually the first 
Um, and, and so far, the only feature film that uses the Tiboli language. Um, and wow. yeah, so so film turned out to be the best medium for the um, for for what I wanted to do for the story that I wanted to tell, and it became really good also because um, unlike some other forms, like if I had read. Um, written a short story or a poem not not as many people would be able to experience or know about it as opposed to if uh, to to me writing um writing and then eventually filming uh this this movie about the Tabali people yeah so that's mm. that was a long story sorry about that <laughs> That was a very that was a very good story. But that that's how I got into story. film. Um, so it was. I think that films have to be, or ex- at least the films that are important to you, they have to be driven or motivated by something very kind of personal or or a personal mission that you have, um, to to be to become significant to you and and then eventually to your audience. So I was kind of moved to do this film. Even if I didn't plan yeah. it, <laughs> I agree. Mm. I agree big time. The dogs as well <laughs> agree. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> But how do you, you know, parang if you can encapsulate your art in one line, or you know, why do you do art in general, or why do you do films or music or writing? Because I myself would argue that. Uh, it doesn't really matter the medium, whether it's film, it's music, it's writing. Art is always about storytelling. Yeah. If you want to, if there's a story that you want to tell, then you can tell it in any, whatever medium that you want. Hmm. But I suppose my question is about how would you, how do you mm, translate that into something? Like film or music or writing. How do I? What like what drives you? Hmm. So, I think you're right that art is um, about storytelling. Art is about making a connection. Um, if I can add to that, um, and it goes beyond the dimensions of time and space. So I'm teaching art appreciation now. Uh, so that's like top of my mind how <laughs> art creates a connection, a mm-hmm. relationship, a conversation between um, uh, between the artist and between the viewer um, beyond time and space. And it is sort of a way as an artist that you become immortal in in a sense. Um, mm. If your work does hold up to the test of time, then you'll continue to be telling your story and moving people and um, creating relationships with people through your work, even beyond, um, you know, even beyond your, your own life. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. Um, what was the question again? I think it does. <laughs> I don't even remember the question. <laughs> But that's the thing about us, you know, young people. All we have are uns- answers. But we've forgotten the questions. <laughs> Speaking of answers, uh, unfortunately, we've come to time. But if there's any advice you'd like to give mm. us or any aspiring filmmakers or writers out there. Mm-hmm. Yes. Just like... Mm. Yeah, good question. Um, so maybe some things that I've mentioned earlier. One is to always um, come from a place that is significant to you. You can't make work that is significant to other people if what you're doing is not significant to you. Um, second thing is always... Um, think of making work that is relevant to um, the the people that you want to reach out to. Um, that 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 kind of goes into a longer conversation mm-hmm. of like commercial films and, mm-hmm. and whatever. Absolutely. But um, I always try to make significant work. Always try to make something that that means more than what's on the surface. 
Um, and then I'll, I'll share with you advice from... More than words. <laughs> I'll share with you advice from my dad um, <laughs> when I was writing a script. So this is for like mostly the script writers um, or as- aspiring script writers. While I was, I was writing um, Kanada Dreamweaver, I had like explosion scenes and underwater scenes and um, like a battle <laughs> scene as well. And... <laughs> right <laughs> and i was telling my dad like maybe i have to take these out because i don't think uh whoever at, at that point i wasn't gonna be the director of the film so i was like maybe i should just take it out because it seems too difficult and he said the the role of a writer or the role of a script writer is to challenge all of the filmmakers working on the film so at the point that you're writing a script, don't kind of hold yourself back from putting in everything that you believe the, the film needs. Um, and this is the only time in the process of filmmaking that a person gets to do that. Once you get to the production phase, that's when reality <laughs> sinks in and you're challenging yeah. all of the other filmmakers to... Uh, kind of execute the vision that you set for them. Um, so as a writer, take advantage of that very rare opportunity of writing everything and anything that you believe should be in the vision of the film that you're doing. Yeah, and in general, for aspiring filmmakers and artists, artists realize that um, the platform that we have is very powerful um and that's why artists are are often silenced by you know the government and and other entities Mm -hmm. because what Mm -hmm. we have is very powerful it's it's a powerful way to um to reach out to people and and to to influence people so use that responsibly but also know that you have a lot of power um in what you do. That's it. We do. It's very true. It's very beautiful. Great, great advice. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Miss Eva. Thank you for having me. Mm-hmm. It's a pleasure. Mm-hmm. It's really nice. It's a really nice podcast. <laughs> yeah. It is. Medyo, you know, kulang nga yata yung <laughs> I feel yeah. like I feel like they could this could easily turn into a you know, Lav Diaz. Oh my gosh! <laughs> podcast, <laughs> a seven-hour discourse on you know art and cinema. <laughs> yeah. But that's Next all time. the time we have for t- today. Thank you once again for tuning in. This has been Miss Ida Del Mundo. A very awesome person, <laughs> and Miss Lee Ramirez, and I have been M. Jack Thank you. <laughs>